hello. I'm uh, interviewing today uh, Jim Warren, who is uh, certainly, in my opinion, the um, leading biographer of the Oxfordian movement. Jim is a uh, retired uh, State Department Foreign Service officer. Uh, he has been stationed, um, I believe, around the world and uh, most recently in Thailand. Um, and he is the author, most immediately, the book we're going to talk about, of Shakespeare. This is always my struggle to get these things in here. Shakespeare revolutionized the first hundred years of J. Thomas Looney's Shakespeare identified. Jim, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to start with basically how you got involved how you found out about um, Looney um, and the, the movement and what led you to produce um, an astonishing series of books. And I think astonishing is the right word. Um, indulge me for a moment in bringing them up. We've, I've shown you Shakespeare Revolutionized. He's also published Shakespeare Investigated, publications of the early... Uh, Shakespeare Fellowship. He has published Shakespeare Revealed, uh, collected articles and, and letters uh, of Looney. Most significantly, I think, is his revised um, uh, work of Shakespeare identified by Looney um, in modern printing with footnotes and whatnot, bringing back to life the core doc uh, document of the uh, Shakespeare movement. And along with that, because he had some free time somehow, an index to Oxfordian publications, um, a novel by an early Oxfordian, uh, <laughs> let me do it this way, um, uh, Shakespeare Fantasia by Esther Singleton, a, uh, a very active freelance writer in New York in the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. He's published a novel of ideas uh, called Summer Storm. And having said that, let's go back to the question I posed and interrupted your answer. How did you get involved uh, with the Oxford movement? Uh, well, Bob, uh, back in um, 2002, uh, a friend of mine mentioned to me the idea that uh, Edward de Vere had actually been the real author of Shakespeare's works. Now, I'd heard ideas like this, uh, you know, uh, attributing the works to Francis Bacon and others, and as far back as high school. Uh, and um, I'd done a little bit of uh, research uh, and, and um, completely rejected the idea of Bacon as, as author. And then, so when this friend mentioned Edward De Beer as the author, I just, you know, my first instinct was, you know, gee, he seems like a normal person. Uh, why is he presenting this terrible, you know, ridiculous idea to me? Um, but once the idea was in my head, um, the, uh, everywhere I looked, I began to see references to De Beer and Shakespeare. I saw that three justices of the U.S. Supreme Court had considered the idea. And in their first uh, take on it back in uh, 1987 or so, um, they concluded that De Beer was not Shakespeare. But all three of them later, after having done more research, concluded that, yes, indeed, De Beer was the author, the principal author of the works attributed to Shakespeare. This was, let me interrupt you for a second. This mm -hmm. was a, um, a moot court uh, conducted at American University. Um, uh, and and uh, um, the uh, justices, um, as you say, first rejected the idea, um, but also, uh, I think it was John Paul Stevens said the Oxfordians need to make a better case for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and that became uh, a, um, a spur to a great deal of Oxfordian research. Okay, I interrupted you. Um, okay. Go uh, ahead. So, um, you know, from 2002 onwards, I had the idea in my head and I thought it might be interesting to, uh, to learn more about it. Um, but I was working in a very demanding career, you know, uh, working overseas at U.S. embassies for the State Department and raising a family. And there, there wasn't a lot of free time to, to put into investigating uh, the issue. 
Uh, but as the kids, uh, you know, went off to college and I had a bit more time, um, I began to read books like Charlton Ogburn's uh, The Mysterious William Shakespeare, um, John Thomas Looney's, um, you know, book that launched it all, um, Shakespeare Identified, and a few other books, including one by um, Richard Whalen, uh, Shakespeare, Who Was He? That was actually the first one I read and brought me most of the way um, into believing that, gee, uh, the evidence seems pretty strong that Edward de Vere was indeed the author. But then around... Um, 2009, at the end of 2009, Paul Altraki, a longtime Oxfordian, um, uh, he's 90 years old now, uh, and is the longest living Oxfordian. He became an Oxfordian when he was 12 years old back in 1941 or so. Uh, his wow. was an Oxfordian. Wow. So, <laughs> he's been an Oxfordian more than most people have been alive, uh, longer than. Um, but um, <clears throat> anyways, he published a series of five volumes uh, collecting old Oxfordian materials, or, or Oxfordian pub, um, publications, uh, articles and excerpts from books from the 1920s and 30s and 40s and so on. And so, um, you know, that got my interest uh, up in um, learning more about the Oxfordian movement as well as the idea of Edward de Vere's authorship. Um, and I thought I might like to actually write something about the subject, but everywhere I turned, I was discovering more and more information, more and more uh, articles and reviews and so on um, that people had already written, subjects already written on. And I didn't want to, in my own work, um, just reinvent the wheel and write on something that had already been written on. So I started preparing a big database of everything I knew of that had been written on the Oxfordian idea. And it took me several years to do that, um, you know, starting from the core of um, uh, the five books that Al Traki had published. Um, that was the start of my database, the uh, detailed contents of all five volumes, combined contents. And that eventually turned into an index to Oxfordian publications. Uh, the uh, green version that you showed a minute ago is the fourth edition. Fourth edition? Yes. Holy mackerel. Okay. And it, it, it has um, a list of more than 9,000 articles and books published on the Oxfordian idea uh, since 1920, since Looney's book was first published. Uh, along with other other lists of um, reviews of books and and uh, a chronology of of um, events during the hundred years and so on. So um, let me let me interrupt for a second. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a diplomat, had you uh, did you carry with you a love of Shakespeare around the world? Was this a subject in college? Had you done other kinds of writing because you write really well? Um, uh, give us a little personal stuff here. Um, <clears throat> well, I've, I've, I've always been a big reader. <laughs> That's a start. Um, but, um, you know, once I started to actually put my own thoughts on paper, I learned that writing is very different from reading. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think it was the sports writer, Red Smith, who once said that writing is very easy. You just open a, blade, a, a, a vein and bleed. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, you know, and um, as I tried to put my thoughts on paper, I recalled uh, Woody Allen's comment that um, the hardest step in writing something, whether it's a screenplay or a book, is getting something on paper. Because once you have a first draft on paper, it's much easier to edit and improve what's already there. Yeah. But to to get your ideas down, get them organized, find a structure for the publication, whether it's a book or an article, and then... Um, put all the pieces in place is, is very difficult. And in fact, I'm in that, that difficult stage right now. I've been working for six months on uh, preparing a seven volume collection of the Shakespeare writings of Percy Allen, one of the great Shakespeare scholars from the 1930s. Was and he British or American? He was British. He was actually the um, drama critic in London for the um, Christian Science Monitor. Uh, a publication based in Boston. Okay. Uh, but uh, he wrote um, <clears throat> about a dozen books and pamphlets and published um, more than 100 articles on the Oxfordian idea. So I've gone back and collected all of those and prepared transcription of, transcriptions of them. And I'm now 
uh, writing introductory essays to each of the seven volumes. Um, so anyways, that I uh, hope to get those books out the door later this year. But um, so after producing the, the big green index, uh, and I had a pretty good idea of what subjects had been written on, which hadn't been, um, then I began, you know, putting my own ideas on paper and published a few articles. Um, but then it occurred to me that um, uh, what the world needed <laughs> was a uh, was to get John Thomas Looney's Shakespeare Identified back into print. And so I, uh, in <clears throat> the middle of 2018, I um, prepared a transcript of that and, and uh, in a modern formatting, um, uh, because all of the editions that were available out there um, through amazon.com, you know, the print on demand books, they're all mere bound photocopies of the original. But I thought what we needed was um, a, a, a version of the book in a modern typesetting that standardized the formatting because uh, Looney and his publisher were not always uh, careful in, uh, uh, in, in using the same formatting from page to page. Um, and Looney did not provide a list of sources. Uh, he would refer to when he, when he quoted from the work of a, uh, a traditional Shakespeare scholar, he would mention the name of the scholar or the name of the book, but not give complete information. So I went back I'm and sorry, go ahead. for over 300 references, um, passages that he quoted, I went back, found the original publication, the edition of the publication and the page number and, and documented where all of his information came from wow. put that into the book. All right. Now, in the original research I'd done, I discovered that uh, John Thomas Looney had actually published uh, a number of articles and written letters to editors in response to reviews of his book that he thought were uh, were not uh, accurate. Um, but these these articles and letters were not available in academic databases or in libraries in the United States. So I knew I had to go to London to track down his original writings. Because at the time, it was believed that he published his big book and then a few articles and then basically abandoned the Oxfordian movement. Uh, but I was finding references to so many articles he wrote that were completely unknown to today's scholars that um, eventually, you know, through my work in London at, at uh, three or four different universities, uh, their, their, um, their special holdings, their collections of original materials, not just the books on the shelf. I was able to determine that, that uh, Looney had written more than 50 articles and letters to editors, some of them quite lengthy, that nobody today knew about. So uh -huh. I collected all of them and published them in a book called um, Shakespeare. Uh, well, you have the book there. I forgot the title at the moment. Shakespeare uh, Investigated, Shakespeare Revealed. Yeah. No, the smaller one. Um, revealed. Right. Shakespeare Revealed. That's right. Right, that's a collection of more than 50 articles that Looney published on the Shakespeare idea. Um, <clears throat> and I was able to issue that in time for the, uh, the 100th anniversary of his book, Shakespeare Identified. Nice. Nice. Uh, but the, the articles in uh, Reveal completely revolutionized understanding of the founder of our movement from someone who had written a big book and then basically left the field, to someone who was actively involved in further research and defending the Oxfordian idea over the following 20 years. So I thought that was a major accomplishment and yeah. one that I thoroughly enjoyed putting together. <clears throat> and um, then I, I realized that um, in all the work I'd done to, to read and gather together the work of not just Looney, but all of the other early Oxfordian scholars from the 1920s and 30s and 40s and so on, um, I probably had read more of those early works than, than anyone else alive. <laughs> and that other people would benefit by having this information at their fingertips. Sure. So I put together a history of the Oxfordian movement. So <clears throat> many, many people who study this, this field, the authorship question, are aware of names such as Percy Allen or uh, Gerald Rendell or uh, Colonel Ward or Captain Ward, you know, Admiral Holland. They're aware of these names and they know that these people wrote um, 
added, you know, did a lot of research and added their own findings uh, to help, you know, build up the Oxfordian idea and movement back in the 20s and 30s, but they really don't know who these people are or what place they actually played in the movement. So I decided to write a history of the Oxfordian movement. Uh And that turned into the big, uh, the big orange book that you showed earlier, um, Shakespeare Revolutionized. I can show it again. Yes. And the title Revolutionized is very significant because the findings that were presented by Oxfordians (laughs) beginning in 1920 onwards uh, revolutionized understanding of how Shakespeare's works came to be written and who who wrote them. And in fact, in in that book, I identify, um, let me back up. Um, Many people who haven't studied the issue um, assume that it's just a matter of taking William Shakespeare out and putting another person in. Uh, And everything else remains the same, but that's not the way it is. Because when you change the person who wrote the works, you change the conditions in which the works were written you move them from being written for the public stage to being written first for performance uh, in the court for Edward de Vere's fellow, uh, fellow courtiers. Um, and because de Vere was born 15 years earlier or so than um, William Shakespeare, when the works were written, is also changed. So I identified not just the big, I, I discussed not just the big idea of changing the person who wrote them, but I identified 12 subsidiary beliefs that must be changed. Um, and in, in combination, um, going accepting all of these 12 subsidiary beliefs and another 50 subsidiary beliefs that, that flow from the 12, which flow from the one, all of these combined um, once you go through and, and accept them all, you, you revolutionize your, your understanding of Shakespeare, the works, and how they became, uh, came to be written. I uh, uh, interviewed Ramon Jimenez the other day for this mm. program mm-hmm. um, and uh, on, on his uh, uh, book on the famous victories of Henry V, which he places having been written by a, a very young Earl of Oxford. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, I'm not sure he was an Earl at that point, but he was 13. That's what he was. And that moves the date back significantly. Um, and, and as you suggest, changes the perception of how things are, how things were. Um, uh, and uh, then Oxford went back years later, picked up that play, used it as the basis for, um, uh, for uh, the Henry plays, uh, among others, um, but that the skeletons could all be found in the famous victories. So um, uh, uh, you are working on a way of helping social and cultural understanding of the creative process. Uh, which was always really important for me. So um, forgive that digression, um, but I'm really interested in the ways in which uh, you applied your research um, and whether there were uh, um, more discoveries that you picked up that you had not anticipated when you began your work. Mm. Yeah, great question, Bob. But before I answer that, um, let me just say that Ramon Jimenez has done brilliant work um, to establish uh, Edward de Vere's authorship of uh, five or more plays yeah. <clears throat> that traditional scholars have, have understood that Shakespeare took and modified to write his own plays. Well, uh, Ramon has, has shown that those plays, which were regarded as, uh, uh, or as labeled as anonymous, no one knew who wrote them. He has established that they were actually written by Edward de Vere, right. as a young man. Right. And that <clears throat> later, as you mentioned, uh, de Vere uh, revised those plays and, and they were later published and performed as the works of Shakespeare. Um, so that changes um, uh, 
understanding of how works come to be written. Uh, because um, William Shaksper from Stratford on Avon had no known education, no known experience in the court, no known knowledge of um, languages, uh, works written in foreign languages that we know Shakespeare drew on. You know, how could William Shaksper, who didn't speak French or Italian or, or Greek or Latin, have read literary works in other languages? And, how would he have gotten a hold of them? Yeah, you how would no public lending libraries? That's right. Books were rare and valuable. Commodities back then, they weren't just, you know, you couldn't just go to Barnes and Noble and buy them. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, establishing that Shakespeare, well, well, the traditional understanding was that, that Shakespeare, uh, William Shakespeare from Stratford, just absorbed these ideas from the air, basically. Or through well, there was a famous tavern, and he went and he listened to travelers. And they taught him yes. French, uh, Spanish, Latin, and Greek, um, and all the customs and the streets in Venice and Verona. And then he went home and wrote Bologna. That's the mild version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The story goes. The traditional story is that he talked to people in bars or taverns, and and <laughs> that's that's how he got the information that he put into the plays. Yeah. Um, and you know that he took these scraps of information uh, and through his own native genius transformed them into the brilliant uh, plays and dramas that we have today. Um, but that's not how great works come to be written. Um, and so this is another of the, the uh, 12 <clears throat> beliefs that have to be changed that are part of the, the, the revolutionizing of someone's thought that, that must take place as they move from uh, the, uh, the traditional um, authorship story to the story of Edward de Vere as the author. Now there, um there are theories of um, mental development, uh, uh, theories in psychology of how the mind works and how people come to understand. What you're saying, it seems to me, is very consistent with that, um, that th uh, the story of Oxford is a story certainly of a, uh, of, of a genius, but it's consistent with the intellectual development of other people and is inconsistent uh, with an uneducated, uh, inexperienced person. Uh, would that be accurate? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, psychologists or psychiatrists tell us that uh, um, those who have studied literary creativity and genius tell us that people, writers, write about what they know about and what they care about. And with, with the... Um, the, the traditional story of, of Shakespeare's authorship, there's no connection between his life and the literary works. And so they've had to posit that the works are completely impersonal and um, that there's no relationship between the works and the historical or cultural times in which they were uh, written. But with the Oxfordian story, we can show, Oxfordian scholars can show that the works grow naturally out of Edward de Vere's life and out of his experiences as the senior most Earl in Queen Elizabeth's court, because so many of the plays address, uh, well, so many of the characters are kings and queens and courtiers in their courts and address uh, diplomatic and political relationships or, or developments that people at that level of society would have been involved with. So these stories, in the plays grow naturally out of Edward de Vere's life. They have no relationship whatsoever to the life of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the grain trader and, and Malter, Malster from uh, Stratford-on-Avon. Malster, I hadn't heard that before. Um, where else besides, did you go to other places outside of London? Did you go to other countries or other cities? Yeah, I, I actually took um, four major research research trips to London to gather the information that I, I needed to write the story of the Oxfordian movement. Um, one of the, the most important scholars from the 1930s was uh, Gerald Rendell, uh, perhaps the most uh, respected scholar, classical scholar in England at the time, <clears throat> um, who became a, an Oxfordian scholar later in the 1930s. Uh, he was one of the founders of the University of Liverpool Oh. and was president of, uh, of the University College for a, a number of years, uh, as well as head, uh, headmaster of uh, uh, another school. Uh, anyways, um, 
his papers are collected at the University of Liverpool. So I was able to go into the Rendall archives and look at all of his papers. Wow. Um, wow. So that was one of the key sources of information. Um, the Shakespeare Fellowship that was founded in 1922 to promote study of the Oxford, Oxford or the, or the uh, authorship question, its papers are in, uh, at Brunel University, which is uh, Brunel's um, in um, Oxbridge, which is uh, Oxbridge, which is now um, a part of London over near uh, Heathrow Airport. Huh. So I was able to go through those archives. Um, but uh, I'm in the University of London in um, it, its Senate House Library has another archives, the papers of Catherine E. Egger, who was one of the early uh, scholars as well. So those are three places in or near London that I went to. Uh, well, I, it's Liverpool's outside, but, but most important of all, the papers left behind by John Thomas Looney when he died in 1944, were those papers that survived were in the possession of his grandson oh. in Northern Scotland. So I, once I found out that those papers, uh, well, I was already in, in touch with his grandson. Um, and uh, so once I knew the papers were available and, you know, I asked him about the papers, he offered to give them to me to do what I thought best with them because he knew of my Oxfordian work. So I went up to Scotland to meet him and his daughter, you know, Looney's granddaughter, uh, sorry, great granddaughter. This was -granddaughter. Looney's granddaughter, grandson that we're talking about. Um. I had a delightful day spent with them. And at the end of the day, he gave me these, these uh, 1,700 or so papers left Boy. behind by Looney. Boy. You know, they're only a fraction of what would have been in Looney's yeah. possession at the time of his death because he was a great letter writer, a great correspondent. But even the uh, it was like 300 letters that were in, among the papers that I got um, dis discussed so many ongoing details uh, you know, finer points of Oxfordian uh, theory, as well as uh, developments in the Oxfordian movement during those decades. Uh, there were even among the papers articles that I had no idea had ever been written and published, but there they were in the papers. <clears throat> and there were links uh, or references to other materials that um, important materials by Looney and others that had been published. So after that trip, which lasted an entire month, because I went to Liverpool and London and, and Scotland and so on. After that trip, I knew after I absorbed the contents of those materials from Looney's papers, I knew I had to make another trip to London. So I, I managed to get there in February of 2020, not knowing that, you know, the virus and the lockdowns were oh, just around the corner. Oh my. So that was a very important trip for me because I was able to locate uh, dozens of scores, if not hundreds of, important articles that um, I learned about from Looney's papers. And it was that information along with everything else that enabled me to write the history of the Oxfordian movement. Wow. Now, since then, I have, um, going through additional papers, um, during my trips, I took 20,000 photographs of Oxfordian documents. And so, you know, of course, I hadn't read them all at the time of that trip early in 2020. But since then, and going through these additional documents, uh, photographs, uh, I've learned of many more uh, very important items that I need to, to see in order to um, complete the Oxfordian story. So to write, because in the big book, the, the big orange book that you show, Shakespeare revolutionized, right. it, 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 it kind of implies that it's a history of the Oxfordian movement over the last hundred years. And it is, in fact, except that I skipped a 40 year period in the middle because I couldn't, I couldn't get back to the libraries to, uh, to research that middle period because the libraries were closed. They were locked down. Because of COVID. Yes. Yeah. That's fascinating. So I went ahead and published that book, which looks at, say, the first 40 years and the last 30 years of the Oxfordian movement. But there's a middle period in there that I had to skip over. So I've got to get back to London now, to the archives of the Shakespeare Fellowship and, and other other uh, archives in order to write the middle years of the movement. This is a big book. I mean, this is 
a big it's, book. it's almost 800 pages yes and it's it's bigger than the nine by six size it's uh, yeah. 10 by seven so, uh, so if yeah. you get 40 more years i mean is that a separate book or are you going to revive this or how's that going to work well what i want to do um once I can uh, write up the the forty year period, and I've already done a lot of work on it. And by the way, the uh, the big stories to be told in the in those middle years are one the story of the Shakespeare Fellowship in England, which um, in the nineteen fifties became the Shakespearean Authorship uh, Society, and then the Shakespearean Authorship Trust, which is still in existence today. Mm-hmm. So I need to tell the story of the, those institutions. In the United States, I need to tell the story of the Ogburn family, Charlton Ogburn Sr. and his wife, Dorothy Ogburn, uh, and their son, Charlton Ogburn Jr. These were among the most important Oxfordian scholars of all time. And uh, I basically had to skip over their story because most of it took place during those, those middle 40 years. So I need to tell their story. And I need to tell the story of Ruth Lloyd Miller and her husband, Minos Miller, very, very important scholars uh, from the 1970s onwards. Uh, and one of the most important things that Ruth Lloyd Miller did was to bring a Looney's book, Shakespeare Identified, and several other uh, very important Oxfordian books back into print in the 1970s to secure the copyright for them and bring them back into print. Uh, but those editions are now out of print, uh, long out of print, which is why I knew in, in 2018 that I needed to issue a new edition of Looney's book, which, uh, because it's a print-on-demand book, will always be available. The book will never again be out of print. You know, so much of this discussion and of reading uh, Shakespeare Identified um, falls into the category of really great investigative work. Um, and were you a professional uh, journalist, um, one would say, wow, that's really strong, powerful, investigative journalism. Um, and, and I think I have always felt that way reading Shakespeare Identified. I, I bought a copy of it in sometime in the ni- late 1960s for the bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard in LA. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of thing where you can't really put it down. It is um, quite the mystery and quite the mystery being solved. And your work is also along that line of solving uh, mysteries. Um, uh, the idea that this country bumpkin whose parents couldn't read, whose children couldn't read, uh, who apparently had no education, and if he had one, it was minimal, um, ends up writing these great works, um, is not an elitist fan- fantasy. It's, um, it's nuts. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. Um, so, um, okay, so you've got three or four trips to London, Um a lot of the plays are set in Italy. Did you go to Italy to do any research? I did, did not, no, because I was not researching uh, the life of Edward de Vere directly. I was researching the Oxfordian movement. Got it. Which began in England and then spread to the United States. And, and important works have been written elsewhere in Australia and so on. Wonderful. So um, uh, in your... Uh, understanding of psychological principles that you learned or sort of put together. Um, what comes out? What, what surprised you? I'm always interested in what surprises an expert such as yourself? Uh, well, Bob, it, it took me uh, six years of, of uh, hard work, you know, 10, 12 hours a day to research and write that, uh, that mm. book. Um, I, I, I think I learned a number of, of things that I found fascinating, uh, which is what kept me motivated uh, sure. you know, during those long years. One is that, um, you know, when you, when you read um, a book about current Oxfordian ideas, you, you, get, you, you absorb the ideas, but you don't get the sense of 
the adventure that people were on as they discovered the things that are, that we now know to be true. And so in going back and looking at each of the major scholars and a lot of the minor ones during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, you know, these were, were groundbreakers. They were developing the path. They were making the first discoveries that, um, of, of facts that we now know to be true. And yet they were, they were, they weren't following a path that someone else had already made. They were cutting their own path through the jungle. And often they went down, they went down false paths or they, they tentatively adopted or believed things that weren't true. So I was able to see, um, and you know, they often disagreed with each other because they were, they were moving, you know, blindly feeling their way forward. Um, but little by little, and, uh, as they communicated with each other, as they shared their findings, they were able to um, bring the disparate facts that each of them had discovered together to form a, a coherent theory. And little by little, over the decades, um, you know, they, they were able to form the theory and the ideas that we now, today, many of us believe to be true. But it was fascinating to see, because Percy Allen, in particular, mm -hmm. came to... Um, to love every new idea that he or anyone else proposed. But he was such a great scholar that um, he didn't let his first love of each new idea blind him. He investigated further to find out which of them were actually true. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of his 30 years of investigating and writing, for instance, he, um, he revised his ideas many times, each time getting closer to what we now believe to have been you know, the historical reality. And others did the same thing. Um, now, another scholar about 25 years ago pointed out that there were a, a lot of these early writings that, are un, that were unavailable when he was writing uh, back in the, in the 1980s uh, or 90s. Um, he said, someone should go back and collect all of these early works and publish them so that others can, can have access to the information. And so um, I did that. <laughs> and another of the big books you just showed, Shakespeare Investigated, is a collection of 335 um, early Oxfordian works that are, have almost all of them been out of print and unavailable. Uh, they're not in academic databases. The, the only way to, to find out and read these works is to go to the libraries that have these rare publications and find them. So I went and found these 335 works, collected them and published them so that, you know, I answered the call that had been made 25 years ago. That's good. But now that anyone who wants to see these works can, can easily see them. Um, and even if they read through all of them, they will see what I just talked about. Scholars blindly moving their way forward yeah. and investigating a completely new field and see how they, you know, they found things, new discoveries that they thought were true and they published it. And then someone else said, no, that's not quite right. This is the correct interpretation of the fact that you found. And by reading that big book, you'll be able to see you know, I hope get a sense of the excitement that these these uh, early scholars felt as they explored this new uh, area. Do you recall who it was who issued that um, uh, call for someone I, to? Uh, I do. To it was it was uh, uh, someone I've never met. His name is Roger Parisius, huh. uh, and he published this call in um, a periodical called the Elizabethan Review which was founded and edited by Gary Goldstein, who's right. now the editor of uh, the premier um, scholarly journal, uh, the Oxfordian, published by the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. I believe that the Elizabethan journal is um, electronically available through yes. the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship website. Um, and I've, I've used, it's, it's very interesting. I'm sort of a history geek in that way. I love going back, but thank you. That, that's very interesting. All right. Um, uh, just briefly, you developed a good relationship with um, Looney's grandson. And I think his name is Alan Bodell. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, uh, where do they live? Is he involved in scholarship? 
uh, is there family pride in what uh, grandpa did? Um, he actually um, was a school teacher. A, uh, like, school. like his grandfather. Yes. Uh, or, uh, well, yes, uh, actually his grandfather, John Thomas Linney was um, at first an English teacher and then later a schoolmaster or deputy schoolmaster of a school in uh, or near um, uh, Newcastle in, in uh, Northern uh, England. Uh, but his grandson became um, uh, a, sci a science teacher, huh. uh, a field, you know, not at all related to uh, literature. And in fact, his, his uh, interests and his focus are in the sciences and he, he doesn't have a strong interest in, uh, in literature. So uh, he knows, of course, of his grandfather's books and, and his work, uh, but it's, it's not a field that he's in, been, uh, it's not an intellectual field that he's been active in throughout his career. That's great. Okay, no problem. Um, so you and I are going to visit any number of times as we go through the uh, Jim Warren Library. Um, and uh, uh, for this first uh, debut performance, um, have we covered things that you feel are essential for understanding first your uh, really extraordinary volume, Shakespeare Revolutionized? but also that something that would serve as guidance for someone just coming new to the subject? Well, someone who's new to the subject of Edward de Vere's authorship might say, uh, as I did uh, when I was new to it, um, well, if this, this uh, Edward de Vere idea was true, why haven't professors in the universities discovered it and why why are they continuing to promote the traditional idea of William Shakespeare's authorship? Um, and that, that's, that's an excellent question. And it took me a long time to understand why pro many professors, literature professors, even today, uh, reject the Oxfordian idea. Um, so in my work over the past, you know, discovering, uh, trying to um, learn about what happened and why, I discovered that academia or literature professors or literature departments have never examined, never subjected the Oxfordian idea, the idea of Edward de Vere's authorship to objective scholarly study. They have rejected it out of hand. Mm -hmm. And they've treated it differently than they've treated all other literary matters. You know, these are, these are professionals in this field. They're paid to examine literary subjects. And yet here is one subject that they rejected out of hand, even though the evidence in support of it is so strong that it convinced three justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, the philosopher Mortimer Adler, psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, and countless others. So there is, the evidence is so strong that it should not be ignored. It should be examined. And if, if literature professors truly have confidence in their belief that William Shakespeare was the author, they would be able to objectively, scholarly consider, you know, su subject the Oxfordian idea to a scholarly examination and show uh, where the facts are wrong that Oxfordians believe are wrong or where their interpretations are wrong or where their, their logic or reasoning is wrong. There must be a flaw in it in one of those three areas if it's false. And you would, and you would think it would be easy to discover. Yes, uh, if, 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 it so if it's so false, it should be easy to find these flaws and point right. them out, but right. they haven't done that. So one of the things I did in Revolutionized was to try to present my, my thoughts on why academia or literature professors have not done that. Why have they failed to do their duty on this most important point of literary history? And the answer I came up with is that literature, those who run literature departments have two goals. One is to create an environment in which scholarly work can take place. Okay. But the other, the other duty they have is to protect the status and reputation of their departments. Now, if it gets out, that a core belief in the most important part of literary studies, which is Shakespeare studies, if, if the core belief in that most important part of literary studies is false, 
that destroys the reputation of the literary institutions, literary departments at universities. So they, 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 there's a clash between these two responsibilities. Yes, they have to promote scholarly work, but they also have to protect the status of, their repu of the reputation of their, their institutions. And so the early, once the Oxfordian idea was out there and, and evidence began you know, snowballing, just accumulating right and left in support of the Oxfordian idea, the people in charge of the literature departments at that time had to make a decision. <laughs> uh, and in, you know, they're not, they, these aren't stupid people. They could see that the evidence in support of Edward de Vere was so strong, right. but they also saw that not only their departments would take a hit to their reputation, they personally would take a hit. And so they thought, well, you know, let's, let's leave it to the next generation uh, to deal with this problem. I'm going to retire in a few years, you know, let my successor deal with it. Um, and, but then his successor had the same idea. Well, I'll, I'll just let my successor deal with it. And so on it goes for 100 years. Um, so that, that's the core of the problem. How do you get from A to B without suffering the harm, you know, the, 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 the institutions and the, the senior professors would suffer in getting from A to B? Well, I think in one of our future discussions, I want to pursue that subject with you because I know it is um, woven throughout your uh, books, um, mm -hmm. how to convince people to show people, to demonstrate that Oxford did it and William did not. Um, and I think that that involves uh, a whole question of uh, strategy um, and various approaches to dealing with William and dealing with uh, uh, De Vere. And I think that um, uh, I want to conclude uh, today's uh, discussion with the sense that upcoming is going to be um, a discussion of how we get the truth recognized. Because the interesting thing is the truth is out there. I mean, you can read your publications, you can read other publications, and you say, wait a minute, this makes no, William of Stratford makes no sense. De Vere makes sense. Yes. Um, and so uh, we will discuss that uh, at another time. Um, uh, and uh, for God's sakes, take care of your throat. Don't write any more big books because my shelves can't <laughs> handle them. Um, but I really, really appreciate your taking time Look forward to seeing you again. Um, and so thanks for joining us. Really oh, appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. All right. Take care. Yeah.